Hello everybody, welcome to the third video in our series on mineral grinding and the sagmilling.com software. This video describes specific energy models, where they came from and how they are size dependent. This is another introductory video, so it is not necessary to have watched the previous videos to understand this one. There's a whole series of comminution models that are used in the industry. This video, though, we're only going to focus on this particular bubble here, the specific energy models. Eventually, there will be videos on all of these other topics, but for now, this is the, the part of the modeling space that we're going to be dealing with. So we need to get a few definitions out of the way. So what do we mean by particle size? When you've got a sample of particles, they're going to have a variety of sizes in the particles. In the laboratory, we have these laboratory sieve sets that have a stack of sieves of progressively finer sizes. And normally you put your sample in the top and you shake the, the screen set and particles settle down until they get to a level where they're, the particle is too large to pass through the square openings of that screen mesh. So when we talk about a particle size, what we're talking about is the, the minimum dimension of a square screen cloth that that particle passes through. And we are normally going to plot these things on these cumulative percent passing charts. There will be another video that deals specifically with these kinds of charts. The key thing you need to know is that the coarsest particle in the sample is going to be up here at this 100% passing point. And then as you go down this line, more and more of the particles are going to be retained on these screen sizes. The screen sizes are shown on the x-axis as you move down these lines. This is a feed in blue and a product in red from a laboratory bond rod mill. As it turns out, this is a classical piece of equipment, and you can see the way that these two diagram, these two uh, lines are drawn. They are basically parallel in this log-log space. Because they are parallel in the log-log space, we can characterize this size distribution from a single point because we know the slope. Because we know the slope, if we just track that particle size that we're, we're following, and as usually we use the 80% passing point, we can then reconstruct the entire size distribution just from that one point. So in this example, I'm showing a dot on the feed that shows what we would call the F80 point, the 80% passing size, which is just over 10 millimeters of what went into this, uh, this mill. And then the product size, the P80, is just under one millimeter that came out of the mill. So a key concept with the standard size distributions with classical grinding equipment, you can track the amount of breakage that is occurring in the machine by just following that one size, the 80% passing size. So we will normally use the term P80 in a lot of the literature that you see, but for the moment I'm going to take a little deviation here and I'm going to use the term X to describe the particle size when we deal with the equations. So here's the first equation we're going to deal with. It, it's actually the specific energy consumption. And this is a measure of how much energy is used to grind a particular mass of rock. The way you compute this is you measure the mechanical power of the mill, and we often use the term, this is the pinion power of the mill. You measure the dry feed rate of fresh feed going through the milling circuit. So again, if there's a circulating load, we don't include the circulating load, only the fresh feed that's coming into the circulating load. And the specific energy consumption is just the quotient of the power divided by the throughput. Now, because H here is in the denominator of the denominator, it can pop up on top. And this is normally the way that we will express it as kilowatt hours per tonne. 
I'm using the convention that E represents the specific energy, but you will also see a convention in, in some other works that W is used for specific energy consumption. And the reason for that is that the units of kilowatt hours per ton also works for thermodynamic work. And we'll be talking in a bit about, about Fred Bond and his models. He used the convention of W rather than E. So a little bit of history here. Um, Lynch and Rowland's book really does a good job describing where the mineral grinding industry came from. And these specific energy models were first proposed in the late 1800s by von Rittinger and Frederick Kick were Austrians who were working in uh, particle breakage. Uh, Frederick was working actually with this brand new substance called rubber and von Rittinger was working much more classically with mineral ores. So von Rittinger's equations, they didn't actually start as equations. They were basically described as a narrative and the, you know, a watered down way to describe the narrative is that the work done in crushing or grinding for, for our purposes is proportional to the area of new surface produced. And if you want to attach an equation to that, you're going to get something that looks like this equation where the specific energy consumption is going to equal some constant times a term that describes the change in particle size. So x1, this is the feed size, and x2 would be the product size. So one over the product size minus one over the feed size. Uh, Frederick Kick's model was quite different. Remember, he was working with rubber and, and rubber, when it deforms, doesn't seem to care very much how big the chunk of rubber is. If you kind of divide by, um, by the lengths, you end up with kind of the, the same properties as a ratio all through the size ranges. So what Kick observed is that the energy required to produce a reduction ratio in volumes is constant no matter the sizes. This is very different from what von Rittinger had proposed. Now, there's a couple of equations in here that you'll see in the literature. I'm going to specifically go with the one on the left because it's a dimensionless ratio. If you have the product size divided by the feed size, the units cancel out. Right, so this could be 10 millimeters over 100 millimeters. The millimeters cancels out. You've got a ratio of 1 over 10. Uh, the logarithmic one is generally more used in the academic world, and it's got its particular niche. But for our purposes, we're going to ignore that one, and we're just going to go with the dimensionless ratio. But there was no real way to measure what was going on in grinding mills at the time. And it wasn't until electric motors became common in the mining industry in the 1930s and 40s that it became possible to measure how much power was being consumed in the grinding process. You could start measuring specific energy consumption and then try and fit these models to the specific energy consumption that's observed in the industry. And that's what this group of people from Alice Chalmers were trying to do. So Fred Bond, uh, Maxton, and, and various others were publishing through the 1930s and 40s where they were collecting a database of industrial grindability information and lab grindability information. And they were trying to connect these dots and if you look at what they were collecting, they were collecting rod mill power, okay, that's obvious, and they were collecting the particle surface area generated in the industrial mills. Well, clearly that's von Rittinger's model. They were expecting to see Rittinger's model describe mineral breakage. Those papers kind of stopped around about the late 1940s, and then there was a little gap. And then in 1952, Fred Bond's model came out, which didn't look like von Rittinger's model. What, you know, I'm going to speculate here, that he basically sat down and, and crunched the numbers that they've been gathering over the last 20-odd years, 
and realized that von Rittinger's model just did not fit the data. Which then begs the question, what does fit the data? And this is what he came up with. At least this is the modern form of what he's come up with. Where the size term is related as 1 over the square root of the size. Now this was kind of a weird exponent and, and Bond was kind of grasping around looking for a, a geometric model that would have these odd units of 1 over the square root of a length. And what he came up with was the idea of a, of a linear crack moving through a sphere. So a linear crack moving through a sphere, a sphere would have these units of 1 over the square root of a length. So that was the model that he proposed for what his empirically derived um, equation was actually giving people. Okay, so we've got three models. Key thing here, I need to take a little segue and say, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. We've got three models here. One or more of them might be useful, but they're all wrong. And the reason that they're wrong comes down to the definition of what a model is. A model is an incomplete representation of reality that people can use to make predictions. Because it's a simplified representation of reality, it is incomplete and it is therefore wrong. But it can be useful if you are using this model within the calibration space where that model was, was configured and you don't deviate too far from that calibration space. The further you deviate away from the calibration space, the less likely you are to have a usable model. So with this in mind now, um, industry did not immediately accept the bond model. There was a period of about 10 years where the literature shows polite discussions, I'm using air quotes, where people were arguing in favor of Rittinger's model even though it didn't seem to line up with Bond's data because it lined up with other people's data and there was basically feathers flying at AIME meetings. It wasn't until 1962 when a paper was published by the Finnish professor Hucky who had gone into the, the, the lab and the quarry that he had access to at the university in Helsinki. And they were doing some energy measurements around explosives, uh, explosive breakage. They were doing some rod milling. They were doing some ball milling. They were doing some fine ball milling. And what Hucky basically came up with is that the model that you use is going to change depending on your size. None of these models describes the entire range of mineral breakage from what you would see in blasting in a quarry all the way through fine grinding. So what his um, supposition was is that you're going to have at the really coarse size blasting that seems to have a similar characteristic to what kick was describing. Things are based on ratios. And blasting a bigger bench, the ratio of your powder factor doesn't change just because your bench is bigger. In the rod milling range, it seemed like Bond's model worked quite well across that, that narrow range. You could approximate what he was seeing with this straight line. And as you move finer into the ball milling and, and down into the finer grinding range, von Rittinger's model worked. And then once you got too fine, things went all squirrely and he couldn't quite seem to make sense of it. So he ended up drawing these, these lines with question marks saying that you're in the little known grind range. Basically, you're, you're too fine. So this was a very, uh, a very good paper that kind of put to, to rest most of the discussion because it said, gentlemen, everybody's right. Be happy which is an interesting thing to hear from a Finn, but okay, we won't go there. Now, there have been other models that have come out since the day. And here's an example of the, this is actually an SGI model, which is a, a generic version of the SPI, which was developed by John Starkey and then went through companies and ended up at SGS. If you look at the published equation for the SGI data, 
the, the size term here has an exponent of minus 0.275, which is about halfway between the bond exponent, which is minus a half, right? If you take one over the square root, that's the same as, as x to the minus 0 0.5. And the kick exponent is basically zero because remember it's a, a unitless uh, ratio. So it doesn't have uh, an exponent. What Starkey was trying to come up with was uh, a measurement for a sag mill. And sag mills operate in a space between rod milling and blasting. So it's more closer to the, like the crushing stage that you would see in classical equipment. So there wasn't a classical equivalent that fit in the size range. But sure enough, if you look at this, it actually fits into Huckey's conjecture. And it was 20 years after Huckey's conjecture that this actually appeared. So again, this, this works really well with the conjecture. Here's something that exists between two of the three classical models that fits perfectly. Signature plots are another thing that showed up a little later. And these are um, generally done in a lab test that gives you two component. It gives you an exponent and a coefficient. You can't explain fine grinding with one single number. You actually need two of them. So here's an example of what that would look like superimposed on Huckey's conjecture is that you can have different slopes for different materials and different coefficients for different materials, which fits perfectly with these multiple lines with the question marks where Hooky is saying, what's going on here? Well, that's what's going on here, is that you've, you've moved out of a regime where you can use one coefficient with a fixed exponent, and you now have to start dealing with measuring coefficients and exponents at the same time. So we've got a bunch of models that operate across a whole bunch of size ranges. Why not come up with a model that uses a variable exponent? So that's what Steve Morell was, was working around back in the early 2000s. The model that he ended up with, it actually comes in two parts. It's kind of a coarse part and a fine part, but they both use the same equation for the exponent. The, the variable on the exponent is the same whether you're in the fine size or the coarse size. But you end up with two coefficients. You've got an MIA coefficient that operates on the coarse side and an MIB coefficient that works on the fine side. And this is the equation for the exponent. Okay, it's this um, to, to really bluntly simplify this, at really fine sizes, this exponent uh, it tends towards about minus 0 0.3 at really fine sizes, and then the exponent goes up to minus 1 and, and, and beyond as you go coarser. So this looks kind of odd, because remember that the bond model we just saw earlier has an exponent of minus a half, and in Morel's equations, minus a half appears at about 200 millimeters. Uh, that's, that's not a rod milling range. And even weirder is that von Rittinger's uh, exponent of minus one appears somewhere around about a half a meter. That, that's clearly not fine grinding. Something doesn't quite fit in Morel's variable exponent and Huckey's conjecture. And what's actually going on here is that you can't hold the coefficient constant in Morel's work. Actually, the two of them are moving at the same time. So this little diagram I've shown where it, it presumes that the coefficient is constant and all you do is vary the, the exponent, that doesn't work. What's actually going on here is that red line kind of has some inflection points and it does some crazy things because the MIB value changes as a function of size at the same time as the exponent changes as a function of size. So that's it for today's video. We've talked specifically here about specific energy consumption models. In the next video, we're going to look a little closer at the bond work index because it's one of the most commonly used metrics in the industry. So we'll talk to you again in the next video.